can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But sometimes I wonder what he can do through me. No great success to show, no glory on my own, yet in my weakness he is there to let me know. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in His power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. And only know the power that he holds when we truly see how deep our weakness goes. His strength in us begins when ours comes to an end. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in His power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect, His strength is perfect, raised in His power, the weak become strong, His strength is perfect, His strength is perfect. That's beautiful. Well, we've been going through a series on the minor prophets, and of course, the minor prophets are not minor because they have nothing to say. In fact, they have a lot to say. One of the great things about the Minor Prophets, they've written short books um, in the Bible, but they also have said quite a bit to say. And today we're going to be looking at a very familiar prophet, which is Jonah, who is considered a Minor Prophet too. We remember Jonah and the whale story from kindergarten and Sunday school and all those good old days. And um, one day a teacher in the school had, was talking about the fish kingdom and she was saying about whales and about big fish and she told the class that there's, a, there's not a fish that's large enough to swallow a human being. And a little boy uh, raised his hand, little Johnny, and he said, yes, there is. Jonah uh, was swallowed by a fish. And the teacher said, no, that's a myth. And little Johnny said, no, that's not. It's a truth. He was in the whale for three days and three nights. And she says, well, um, you know, uh, that's not true. And he said, yes, I'm, when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask him. And she says, uh, well, you're not because he's not going to be in heaven. And he said, yes, he is. And she says, well, what if he's not in heaven? And she says, well, uh, then uh, you can ask her, teacher. 
Well, sometimes that happens, you know, and there are people who've been followed by Swiss, who have been swallowed by fish or whales or even the, the sperm whale and, uh, and, and have survived. And today, though, the scriptures here speak to us about the book of Jonah. And it's interesting, Jonah is an interesting prophet because he barely was a rebellious prophet. And uh, many people don't know this about him. Yes, at first he rebelled, but even towards the end of, of this, um, his book, uh, he did. And uh, we're going to look today at the macro of God's love and mercy. That's what this book is about. Uh, it f- mentions four times about the fish. It mentions nine times about the city. Jonah's mentioned 18 times, but the most popular person in this uh, book is God. And that's why it's spoken about 38 times, because God is the primary person in the book. And it's about his mercy and about his love. And how he is sovereign to have plans for our lives. Each one of us, God has in his plan. And that we are, he's got us going to places and doing things. But in the process of his sovereign plan, there's what they call this free agency. And that we as free agents have choices to make. And he includes them in his plan. And the story is, is about Jonah is true. It's spoken about, and it's a short story, but it's a marvelous story because it gives us the account of God's mercy and love, not only to individuals like us, but also to nations and how God works with nations and how he's a God who's over the kings and over the world. And as we think about this, we think about God's righteous judgments and how he deals with people. You know, they have a, um, a, uh, one of the things is that Jonah had a intense anger and hatred towards the Assyrians. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And God was calling Jonah to go to Assyria and especially Nineveh and preach the gospel or to preach the truth about them so that they would repent. And Jonah had a hatred towards the Assyrians because they made the Nazis look like little schoolboys in the way they tortured people. In fact, what they did is they often made pyramids of the skulls of the people that they killed so that people would be reminded of their ruthlessness. They would also skin people while they were alive. They would also uh, decapitate them. They would rip their tongues out. They would have pyramids of human hands that they would chop off just to remind people that they were in control. This is how ruthless they were. And God says to Jonah, I want you to go and preach to these people. And Jonah's not too thrilled about it. We see it here. He says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Jonah, the great Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has become up before me. And Jonah rose and to flee to Tarshish from the presence of God. And he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, And paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now if you notice, Tarshish is 2,500 miles, the furthest place he could get away from what he was supposed to do. And Nineveh was only 550 miles. But he was going because he did not want to do God. He rebelled against God. He refused to go. And here God gives him his free agency. But in the process, we come to understand that no matter what, no matter how much he rebels against it, God is going to have Jonah do what he wants to do. And, he's, if he, and, and God is going to make him go and do what he wants him to do. You see, it's interesting how this happens sometimes in all our own lives of free agents. Sometimes we find ourselves and we know what God wants. And we make mistakes, though, because we decide we know better than God. I had a friend in high school who him and his girlfriend had met when they were in sixth grade. And they dated all through high school. And they lived a very um, morally clean life until the senior year. And then my friend Bob decided that, hey, we're seniors now. We should become more intimate with each other and all this kind of stuff. And he really put the pressure on her and she broke it off with him. And he got very angry with her and started dating another girl, a girl that was going to give him what he wanted. And of course she did, but he also gave him a baby. And after they graduated, they got married. And I remember seeing him at our 10-year reunion. And he said, boy, did I make the biggest mistake in my life. 
He said, we had three children, that other gal and I, and we wound up, we couldn't stand each other before that we had to just finally break it off. And, and now I see the kids on weekends and my life's a mess because I didn't do what God wanted me to do. I should have stayed with that other gal. Well, that happens. And you see how easy it is that Satan has a way in which he offers us. Isn't it amazing for Jonah that when he is told to do what God wants them to, to do and he doesn't want to do it, how there just happens to be a ship. And we're not talking about, they didn't have schedules like we have today, even in our airports we have problems or shipping vessels. They didn't have those kinds of schedules because the shipping and the weather was always predicated on what they could do. And here the ship is ready for him to go to Tarshish, to go away from God, to stay away. And this is what happens in our lives, folks. Sometimes we get that better offer. Satan allows that to come into our lives to get us off track of what God want, wants us to do. And it's so easy to fall into that and to fall into what God doesn't want us to do. And there's that offer to us to, to claim it. And what happens is then is that there's collateral damage. You know, when we run from God and we don't do what God wants to be and God puts the hammer down on us, God just lets us, as it says in Romans, that he allows that just the natural consequences to take place, like with my friend Bob, what happens is we find we have collateral damage. And here we see that with Jonah. Here they are on the boat now, and the sailors became afraid because the storm, God whips up on them. And every man cried to his God, and they threw cargo, which was in the ship, into the sea to lighten them for them. And Jonah also had gone below to, to hold the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. Now it's interesting that we find two things here. That number one, the collateral damage that the owners of the ship are experiencing. What they're doing is now they're taking the, the freight that they're supposed to take over to Tarshish and is not going to make it there. And they're going to be a great loss financially because of Jonah's disobedience. And oftentimes we see that, don't we, with the collateral damage that people make in their lives when they don't follow God's will. And how many people are hurt and torn because of what has happened. Each one of us has a story, I'll bet, of someone that we know who should have not been selfish, but instead did something very selfishly and it cost kids or adults or different people in their life because and it damaged. It damaged the church. Maybe it damaged a marriage. Maybe it had an effect on a work relationship. Whatever. We can see that in the world that we live in. When we become selfish, it's so easy to have that collateral damage. And we notice with Jonah. He thinks he's running away from God, and he says he is, to get away from the presence of God, but he knows God is there all the time watching him. You know, that's the thing. We can say that we're doing our own thing, but God knows. And if you're a child of God, he doesn't want to let you go. He doesn't want you to fall into those things. And there are times when he loves us so much, he's going to make our lives miserable. And here Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I know he's there, and that he's watching me. But God will sometimes then cause that collateral damage to be terrible. I can remember a friend of mine as a pastor. He had a large church that was growing, and he was going to build a new church. And... As he was going along, the money was flowing in, and, but as he got going, his eyes got bigger and bigger than what God wanted him to be. And what had happened was it began to have some money shortfalls. And one of the things that he did, though, he did some illegal practices behind the church's back, and it was terrible. Uh, one of the things he did, he bought a piece of land for really inexpensive from a person and then sold it for a million dollars and cashed it into his pocket. There were other things that he was doing that were illegal, but then what had happened was his bank account got full, but the church was struggling to pay for, the, pay, pay for its building. 
And one of the things that he began to do then, he began to uh, do some things illegally as trying to wash some money uh, with the church's funds and wound up, um, found himself that it wasn't uh, people who were drug dealers, but they were actually DEA agents he was washing the money for and wound up going to jail for it. And you see, all, and then all the collateral damage along the way, his wife, his marriage, his children, it all fell apart. And the saddest part was the people who believed in the God that he was preaching. They were believing him in what happened. We've seen this happen time and time. We saw this happen with Jimmy Swagger. We saw this happen with Jim Baker, where people were believing in the God that they were proclaiming. And when they failed and when they sinned, they brought down God's name into the dirt. There are people here today still that I know that have a struggle believing in God and believing in the church because they've been so hurt by that kind of a thing. And he was a gifted pastor. He was a talented man, a great preacher. But it cost, and that was the collateral damage from his sinfulness that cost the church. Well, as we see here now, God causes the sea and everything. And they're discussing, well, how do we get rid of this storm? And they say, he says, throw me overboard. He wants them to throw him overboard. Now, some, uh, some think that he did it because he wanted to die. He didn't want to have to deal with going back and doing what God wanted him to So he wanted to die and have them just throw in. Others felt that God had pointed to him because he was going to go inside the fish and he was going to deal with himself. And so the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow him. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. And what happens is, if we know that he's sleeping in the basement of that, that in, in the stomach of this fish. And there's a time in all of our lives, and folks, don't be surprised if this happens, that there's some people who are sociopaths, and yet they're really just for themselves, and they're very at peace when they're taking care of themselves. Here Jonah is in the belly of this fish asleep. He's got such peace about him. And there are people like that. They don't care what's happening to other people around them. They don't care what the, 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 whether they're afraid of drowning or not. They're at peace with themselves because they don't feel the pain. And here he is, the prophet, laying in the belly of this fish, asleep and at peace. And he's got a false sense of peace because God's going to deal with him. And that fish comes along, God has him get burped out of the fish, uh, into the, he, he swallows Jonah, and Jonah's laying in that fish for three days. And there's a false sense of security, but now he's in trouble. He's in that fish, and he's crying out to the Lord. He's panicking, because God is testing him. There are times in all of our lives that God will bring tests in our lives. There are times that God will bring struggles into our lives. There are times that God will bring tension into our life in order for us to take a look at what we're doing with our life and, and he'll bring storms into our life. And this is what he's done with Jonah. He's brought this storm into Jonah's life and he's brought this fish into his life for Jonah to face what he's done. And the Lord appointed that fish for a purpose, you see. And a lot of people say, well, God would never do that to anybody. Yes, he does. God brings storms into our life for a reason. He wants us to be aware that we're missing the boat. Sometimes he does it for punishment. Sometimes he does it for, to teach us. Sometimes he doesn't even do it for our sake. He does it for people around us so that they can learn how we handle certain situations as believers in the Lord. But be that as may, Jonah, we know, is in the belly of this fish because he's got to learn the lesson from God, that he learned to obey God. And it's interesting in this, that when God sends the fish, he swallowed up and for three days he wrestles. God wants him to really wrestle. And in the process, notice what Jonah's worried about. He's worried about himself. Get me out of here. In this passage, it's interesting, I was reading this over and over his and he wasn't confessing to God that he had done anything wrong, except maybe he didn't go where God wanted him to go. But he didn't deal with the hatred that he had toward the Assyrians. 
Rather, he just cried out and cried out to the Lord. And God sent that calamity for him to realize he needed God's grace to bail him out. And in fact, he needed that, otherwise he wasn't going to be saved. And God becomes merciful. And, and after three days, he prays and he, God delivers him. You see, it's interesting that we oftentimes put ourselves in hazardous conditions like that. Because we are disobedient to God. And what we want to do is we want to do it our way. And God here wants Jonah to wake up and realize he's got to confess that he was disobedient to God's will and that he also needs to get rid of his prejudice towards the people. And it's interesting how God, by his mercy, still gives Jonah a second chance. The Bible says, Then, Jonah command, then the Lord commanded the, the fish and it vomited Jonah back up onto dry land. You know, there's some people who say, well, you know, um, I'm going to act now and ask for forgiveness later. And, you know, we, we kind of laugh and chuckle at that joke. And there's some Christians who think that God always has to bail us out. But he doesn't. There are times in the Bible he doesn't bail us out. We find that in Ai in, in the Old Testament. We also find with Ananias and Sapphira, he doesn't bail them out. In fact, he takes their lives. We see it again in Lot's wife who turned to a pillar of salt. You see, it's easy and, and, and God is gracious and he's merciful and he wants us to grow. But we can't take for granted that he's going to always give us the go-ahead card, the get-out-of-jail card. Because sometimes he may leave us in there to struggle like he did with Jonah for three days. And now here we see God again, by his mercy, commands the fish to throw up Jonah. He throws him out onto the shore and God takes this prodigal prophet and he is going to go do what God wanted him to do and be obedient to God's will. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim unto it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. And so Jonah does. Jonah does a beautiful thing. He goes out and preaches the word. And notice what the word is in, chapter, in verse 4. It's only eight words. He doesn't have a big sermon, doesn't have a long sermon. It's just, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That God will convert it. God will take it over. If it does not change, it will be overthrown. And they listen, and 600,000 people are converted. And then the people of Nineveh believed God's call, and a fast, and put cloth, sackcloth on, and the greatest to the least of them. Now here's the deal. We are living in a culture right now where God has been shut off. There's a lot of young people today who have pushed away God. They don't even believe in God. And this is our challenge right now for the church, to be like Jonah, to get out there and preach. Notice Jonah didn't have any big speech. He only had eight words. And one of the things that's so important for us is to realize what we have and the wonderful hope that we have for a culture right now that is struggling. They're in deep stuff. They have no hope. Every, it amazes me how many suicides a year that we have in Wichita of young people who are desperate. They want something, but they don't know what they want. And they're, 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 they're grabbing. Again, last week, two suicides I had working with the police department of young people who are in despair. No place to turn. They lost their hope. And, 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 and a girlfriend breaks up with them and they take their life. It's sad. They need to understand that the joy of life is God through Jesus Christ. We have that. And there are young people today who are, are, are learning in a culture that God is not where it's at. There is no such thing as God. It's your spirit that renews you. No, that's not it. And we need to proclaim the truth of the message of Christ's forgiveness and the hope of eternal life and the hope for this life that God can take us and change us and bring us great joy and happiness because of what he's done for us and how he wants to live with us. And you see, it's God's merciful power that worked with Jonah, that reached Jonah's heart that touched Jonah 
and brought him back to where he needed to be. We as Christians have this great hope and God's power can change it. Jonah is now given grace and mercy. God has given Jonah the second chance to go out and do what he was supposed to do in the first place. 600 people, 1,000 people come to know him through eight words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. We have that right now in our culture. Our culture is being overthrown. People are throwing it away and they don't realize what they are throwing away. What our early fathers of this nation put down that were Christians who really hoped and prayed and wanted this to hold right is now we're taking down the symbols, not only the symbols, but the very foundations that held this culture together and are being destroyed. They need to know the reason why they were put there in the first place. They need to know that God, when we put God in place, in his rightful place, that things will go well. But these children need to know it now. We need to give it to them. And you see, it's not our ability to do it. It's God's power that can change it through the lips and actions of us who go out into that world every day. You see, every generation is just one generation of not knowing the gospel. Every generation needs the next generation to teach them about God and his love and his mercy and grace. Otherwise, they won't have it. And we're coming very close in our culture today that they're not seeing it, they're not hearing it, they're not experiencing it. And that's why you and I are called to visit with them to teach them about this Jesus, this mercy that he's given to us, and the life that walks in the righteousness of God and not in their own righteousness. This is where God wants us to be. The problem is the Christian church is missing its calling. We have it, and they need it, and we're not getting it to them. The media and, and, and the social theory and all the stuff that's pulling apart our culture and taking it away from God is winning the day. And we have to come back and trust God first as Jonah learned that God can make the changes in our culture. And then from then on, we step up and we begin to talk and we begin to share and we begin to give it to them. I'm amazed every time I talk to kids how some of them don't even know about Jesus Christ. Some of them have never darkened the door of a church. It's scary. And how we as Christians have this wonderful hope a God who can heal and bring hope and forgiveness. Some people lose because they lose it because they become embittered towards God because of things that have happened to them in their lives. I know a lady who I went to visit her one day and knocked on her door and she has been embittered towards God for 52 years. Because when her boyfriend left her house when she was 20, now she was 72, he pulled his car out onto the highway and was killed. And she has held her bitterness against God because of his death and that her whole life was messed up. She never remarried, she never got married. She always was angry with God. She needed somebody to come beside her and love her and show her the grace of Christ and how he could help her through that crisis. We need to have the values that God has, that every person is valuable on this earth and needs to know the Savior. They need to know it now. Look at what happens with Jonah in chapter 4. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became very angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said that you would do was still in my country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, 
slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Here Jonah is mad at God because he has allowed these Assyrians to repent, to have a relationship with him. And he's angry because he's still got his prejudice and bitterness toward them working. He doesn't want to forgive them. And he says, God, I knew you were going to do this. I know that's the kind of God you are. You're a forgiver. You're a God who's compassionate on sinful people who are so locked into their sin they can't see it. And yet you're that kind of God who's gracious. And you just don't blow off steam in anger and, and, and abundant, but rather you're abundant with your loving kindness. And you don't want to bring them calamity. You see, that's what God wants in our world. He doesn't want to bring calamity on, on our nation. He doesn't want to bring calamity on the world. He wants the world to know him. He wants them to experience the compassion and love that Christ showed us on the cross and died for us so that we could have eternal life. That's what he wants. And he wants Jonah to get this. So hard sometimes to get those messages. It's so easy to hold on to a grudge, so easy to be angry rather than to trust God and forgive. And Jonah has to be taught another lesson. Jonah goes and pouts. He sits on the outside of this area now and he's hot. And God sends this tree to go over top of him and cool him down. And while he's over top of him, it cools him down. And he feels comfort from the tree, but then a worm comes and bites it and it dies. And he's mad. He's angry because he's concerned that he's not being cooled down. And then God speaks to him again. And it's interesting that we don't see an answer from Jonah. Because you see, Jonah's worried about him being cool and this plant not being over his head anymore. And God says to him, he's not pleased with him. He says, please, Lord. Was, <clears throat> he goes, then the Lord said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about this plant? And he says, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said to him, you've had compassion on this plant, which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which you came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I have not compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not have know the difference between the right hand and left as, as many animals? And God says to Jonah, Jonah, you're a little worried about this little plant that you didn't do anything for. You didn't nurture it. You didn't grow it. I did. I put it over you to take away the heat. And you're all upset about this thing. And yet you're not worried about the 120,000 people who are going to die and go to hell. You don't care about them, especially the children who do not know their right hand from their left hand. You're more worried about that. And we have to be careful of this. God doesn't answer the question to us whether Jonah ever repented of this. But we have to be careful in our own lives. We have to think about it. Think about it yourself. How often do you get really upset about something that happens in your life that's insignificant. I do. I get upset. And when you see the stock market go down, or you see that something happens in your life that's really not that important, you get all upset and wound up about. And yet I'm not worried about 
my neighbor down the street who doesn't know Christ, who could probably die and go to hell. How concerned am I for them? I was sitting in the park the other day and I was praying and I was asking myself, you know, there are people passing by. And I was thinking, you know, what, what about them? Where are they going to be? Where are they going to be in eternity? And I think we sometimes worry about the insignificant things rather than what God is worried about. And that there are millions of people. There's supposed to be over 100 million Christians in this world. How many of us, if we really took God's priorities and worried about people going to hell and saving them, would this world be a much better place? But how often we get ourselves caught up into the little things that are so less important, like maybe spilling a glass of coffee on our shirt or getting upset about something that happened during our day that was really just not that big of a deal. That we're more worried about the minor details than what's really most important. I just pray that we can be stirred in our hearts to be concerned for people eternity, eternally, and that we can lead them and that that will lead this nation to the righteousness that God desires for. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you and we give you thanks that you're a God who's concerned for us. And Lord, give us your priorities. Help us be concerned about that neighbor down the street or that kid across the street or that troubled youth that in our neighborhood is doing drugs. Lord Jesus, give us hearts that will reach out to them and bring them the wonderful news of Jesus in their lives. Thank you, Christ, for these brothers and sisters who have a passion for others. Help us, Lord, to continue to build that passion. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise and receive the benediction and sing our closing song. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that.